Welcome to the Advanced Freelancing Podcast. Every week, you'll hear strategies for building your online service-based business your way. And now, here's your host, veteran freelancer, author, and TEDx speaker, Laura Briggs. This week's episode is one with guest expert, Ellen Goodwin, who has an extensive background in freelancing. In fact, she was a graphic designer for 20 years before burning out and letting procrastination take over her business. And now she's completely revamped and remodeled it. She's a productivity trainer, TEDx speaker, and author who uses neuroscience-based principles to enable individuals and businesses to overcome all types of procrastination, build stronger habits, and be more focused so that they can be more efficient and effective with their time. She believes that when it comes to productivity, there's no one-size-fits-all solution, which is why she advocates for experimentation. She recently released her first book, Done, How to Work When No One is Watching, and is the co-host of the Faster, Easier, Better Show podcast. You'll love some of the time management, productivity, and distraction-related tips in this episode. Hello, everyone. It's time for another episode of Advanced Freelancing. And I love talking to people who have had skin in the freelance game for a long period of time because it's just so much more authentic when you can hear from someone who has done this for years or who did it for years. And one of the topics that I think is really relevant to all of us right now is this idea of pivoting and what happens if you no longer love doing what you like doing in your freelance business at one point in time, or you need to change services, or you just have a new passion. And so my guest today has done that and has pivoted her business after being a freelancer for a really long time. So welcome to the show, Ellen. I'm so excited to hear more about your story. Thank you. I am so glad to be here, Laura. So how did you get started in freelancing and what kind of services did you offer? I got started in freelancing when I left the advertising agency I was with. Um, This was back in the, oh my God, (laughs) mid nineties. So the ad agency I was with, things started going downhill. The writing was on the wall that there was going to be layoffs. And so I kind of had, had put out my feelers a few months before as to getting out and doing more uh, advertising, creative advertising without the benefit of the ad, the agency I was in. So um, I left there like the week before they had massive layoffs. So um, I, I just left and went out to start my own business, did a lot of graphics, did a lot of advertising, and uh, yeah, left a big company to just be out there all on my own. Was it hard adjusting from working? I mean, even in an agency, you have multiple clients or multiple things Mm -hmm. you're probably working on, but was it hard to go from having that job where you're employed to suddenly you're doing the same thing, but now you have to create your own paycheck? Oh, absolutely. Um, Before I left, you know, like I said, I had a few months that I was, uh, I was getting ready. I had put money aside and uh, which was a good thing because I left in November and I did not have a paying client until, what, February. So I left at the end of November and uh, February. So I had like about three months of, of doing a lot of pitching to people. What happened is the clients that were going to come with me didn't. A uh, bit of a surprise, not a happy one. Um, so there was three months of, of, of pitching a lot of people, offering help doing things like that. And I remember one day my husband at the time came to me and he said, you know, are you ever going to work again? <laughs> I'm like, just wait, it'll be fine. And after that three months, things just kicked in and away they went. But yeah, you know, over the course of, of 20 something years, there was always feast or famine. And it didn't matter how long I'd been doing things. Feasting time was fabulous, and the famine time always tried my confidence. But I, as I did it longer and longer, I always knew that things would come back, and that was part of the time where I put together things that I could do. So I, I would keep myself occupied. I would move myself forward. So when everything started coming back, it was much better. But yeah, starting out was a little scary. I think a lot of us have struggled with that feast or famine cycle, and it feels so good when you're at, in the period where you have so much work, and it, it's almost even a little bit stressful because it seems to be that you'll go from 
not fully booked and you have lots of free time in your schedule to all of a sudden you have almost so many clients where you're overbooked, you're, you're riding that line or you're over it. And so, but people seem to struggle psychologically more at the famine part of things. So what were you doing in those downtimes to sort of keep your spirits up and still keep things moving forward in your personal and professional life? Well, um, there was a couple things and I've actually, you know, have clients that have, have, we've done this with because it's, it works so well. Um, one of the things I always did was I had a notebook going, especially, especially during the feast times where it felt like there wasn't enough time in the day to even breathe. But I always had a notebook to jot down the things like, you know, if I had time, I would be doing this. I would be sending out this mailer to people. I would be reaching out or I would take this class or whatever it was. I just wrote them down in a notebook. So it was always there. And so when I hit the famine part, it wasn't me sitting around going, gee, what should I do? Uh, which is, I know we'll get into this, but it's a prime cause of procrastination. Your brain is trying to decide things. So it was never, I didn't have to decide. I had the notebook and, and I had the things written down. The other thing I would do, and again, especially during famine, I mean, feast, because it helps during famine, is I had another, I had this other notebook, and it was a very nice one. It was a heavy cover, and it was very beautiful. And every time I got a compliment from someone, every time someone said, gee, you do such good work. I don't know how we'd work without you. You know, anything that was a compliment, I would write that down in that really nice notebook. And when I was having a crisis of confidence, when I wondered if I would ever get work again, I would go to that book and I would look at it and it would remind me that, hey, you know what? I'm a, I'm a good designer. I'm good at what I do. Everything will come back. That's so important to remember when you're facing any kind of a struggle, whether it's that business has slowed down or like right now we're recording this in the midst of a pandemic. And I know a lot of freelancers are nervous because they're afraid about their clients pulling their contracts or scaling things back. I've had a couple of coaching clients who have experienced that um, already and are kind of riding the waves, but we all have these things that we want to do. And so I love the idea of having those two different documents, you know, one to help push you up about your skills and make you feel more confident about it and not get sucked into sort of the negative mind space that it's easy to get into about those issues, but also keeping track of these other projects that you don't have time to do when you're in feast mode, uh, you know, updating your website or taking a new course or learning something new or finding Finally updating your LinkedIn profile. These different kinds of things are so easy to push off, but it's a great way to reboot and come back fresh. And I find too that there's also some natural cycles to freelancing as well. Towards the end of the summer, it gets really, really quiet. August, you know, a lot of people are, they tend to be out of town. Uh, they're just not thinking about business until after Labor Day. And then of course, you know, around Christmas and the first of the year, things are pretty quiet for a while. So I use those opportunities to build in vacations, to build in, like I will purposely say my office is closed during these times so that I don't have to, you know, even think about it and take a little bit of an extra break. So I love those tips. Now I know, I know a little bit about your personal story and how it has impacted what you're doing today, but I know one of the things that you struggled with a lot in your design business was procrastination. So I'd like to dive a little bit more into how did you see that showing up? And then how did that ultimately lead to, you know, the changes that you made in your current or in your former business that led to your business today? Okay, sure. Um, so we were talking about graphic design. Um, I, I was married and then I got divorced. And it wasn't like my ex-husband was always watching over me because he wasn't. He had his own job. But it got to the point where, you know, no one was watching. I was responsible for working when no one was watching. No one was ever coming home and saying, hey, what'd you get done today? And while I had clients that had me on schedules, you know, sometimes I miss those. Sometimes, you know, they, people would say, hey, you know, we need this next week. Okay, well, that's, you know, does that mean Monday? Does it mean Friday? It's, you've got some choices. So um, I went through a period where I started to procrastinate a lot. I would put things off. I, wa I wasn't excited about what I was doing. And so I would find a million and one other things to do. 
and clients started to notice. And I, I lost a few clients. I missed a few jobs. And then I almost lost my business because clients were like, you know what? You're, you're not reliable. And this was all because I was procrastinating. The stupidest thing in the world because I have control over it. And yet I almost lost everything just because I couldn't get my butt in the seat and do what I needed to do. Do you feel like procrastination is a signal for something being off either, you know, within your personal life or within your business that it's a signal of something that's bigger than just not wanting to do the work at any point in time? I think it can be. I think it definitely can be. And it's something to look at. Are you putting things off because you're not excited? Are you putting things off because you feel overwhelmed? Are you putting things off because you don't know how to do them or you're self-sabotaging or is it because of one simple thing, which is your brain and it's playing games with you, which is I think really where most of our procrastination does come from. Whether it's if you're a freelancer, even if you're in a, in a, you know, J O B our brains just play games with us. So how do you tell um, the difference between your brain is playing, you know, a game with you mm-hmm. versus it being something like, man, I'm really burned out on offering this service or I have too many clients where it's something in your business that you might be able to tweak. I'm just sort of curious because it seems like sure. it's really hard to tell that difference. Yes. Yes. So, um, well, let's, we'll go first into what your brain is doing. And then once you know that it's easier to, to make a determination, uh, part of the reason we procrastinate is our brain loves to be comfortable. And our comfort zone is the number one place our brain wants to be. Um, in your limbic system, which is the oldest part of your brain, that's where your fight or flight response is. And instead of being in the, the fight mode, our brain wants to be in the relaxed mode. It wants to just be chill because when it's in fight or flight, it's, it's on edge. It's you know, looking around every corner. But if you can relax and be in your comfort zone, your brain is happy. So your brain looks for everything it can to get you into the comfort zone and away from where you don't feel comfortable. So you need to look at why are you not comfortable? Is it just because it might be a challenge? You're, you're just challenged by something. It's something you can do. Your, your job, you know, maybe in, like in the case of being designer, okay, you've got this design project and maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. Is your brain telling you to put it off because you're scared or because you don't want to be there? You don't want to be, be doing it. If you're just scared, just then that is that you can take care of. If you don't want to be there, that's something to really look into. And I know that's what you're asking me here. Um, and what you, I think what you would see more, because, you know, uh, when I had that procrastination, it was just, it wasn't that I didn't want to be there. It was just, I wasn't happy. It turned out with my life. Uh, I think you can tell more when, when if, if, you, if you were to set a timer and say go on a project, if you could just jump into it and, and go with it, and a, I think you would be uh, trying to explain this clearly. If you could just set a timer and go despite everything, then I think it's more that's just you. you giving into your brain when you're procrastinating. But if you're really feeling like, no, I I can't even, I can't even. You set that timer and the idea of even trying to do that, that is when you have to like have a little come to Jesus and say, hey, do you even want to be doing this? Hey, if you're listening to this episode, then the Six Figure Freelancer book is available for pre-order. The book drops on October 20th, 2020, but you can pre-order the book now and get four special bonuses that no one else will have access to. 
Visit www.sixfigurefreelancebook.com to discover how you can pre-order and send in your receipt to get special bonuses that will be revealed to you and sent to your email inbox on October 1st, 2020. This is in addition to the 17 worksheets and exercises that come for everyone who buys the book. And trust me, you're going to want these bonuses, tips on branding, pricing, sales calls, and so much more. Wow, that's such a good point because... A lot of us internalize that procrastination as there being something wrong with us. Oh, well, I see other people out there and they're just so much more motivated. I guess that's just not me. And so I just have Mm. to let that go. When you see someone who starts to experience some of the challenges with procrastination, which always bleed over in other ways into our life with our family, or like you mentioned with clients. I mean, I... I would procrastinate on on client projects last summer when I was nearing burnout mode after my Mm. book launch and I would make mistakes because of that. And so that was just so embarrassing when I made like several, you know, typos in a piece Mm. that I turned into a client. I was just so embarrassed. Like they were very gracious about it. But when you start to notice this procrastination and these kinds of things popping up, what are the first things that a business owner should do to kind of address it and figure out like, okay, I I know this issue is happening. What do I do now to try to fix it? Okay. Um, First of all, quit blaming yourself. Like I said, Mm -hmm. every one of us has this in our brain. It's It's neuroscience. And so quit blaming yourself. Take a look at why you're procrastinating. You know, are you procrastinating because you're afraid of something? Are you procrastinating because you're distracted? You're allowing yourself to be distracted. Are you putting things off because they're not important to you? Um, Or are you putting things off because they're too far away? I mean, that's a big one. Oh, I've got this big project and it's, you know, I've got two months to finish it. And so that deadline is, you know, two months away. I'm going to take care of this other stuff today. So you have to look at what type of procrastination you are dealing with and then address it, each one of them individually. So if, let's say, you know, distractions are the way that that you're procrastinating, you're giving in to distractions, then you make a plan to avoid them. You put blockers on your phone, you put blockers on your computer, you, you set timers when you can for time when you can be distracted. You make sure that if you are doing a distraction that you enjoy, let's say your distraction is you, like me, like to, to check out the news. Well, fine. You set a time when you can be distracted and you make that distraction awkward. In my case, I cannot sit at the computer and look at the news. I have to be up walking around my house with the news on my iPad. So, uh, so that would be, you know, distractions. If it's just things are not exciting and so they're, let's say they're low value things, then you need to find a way to get started. And you can, you can make a game out of getting started. You can do the old Mel Robbins thing of counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, go. You can, uh, you can make a game out of getting started. You just write down all the things you need to do that aren't very exciting, that they're low priority write them down, number them, and then roll a dice. And whatever number comes up, that's the job you do right then. That sounds like so much more fun than just coming up with more excuses <laughs> to procrastinate. One of, one of the tips that someone gave me once, the, the thing I procrastinate on the most far and away is my PhD dissertation. It just oh, always Lord. takes a backseat <laughs> to everything else. And so what I've done is I put little five minute blocks in my calendar where there's no real time after it. Right. So there's, there's more time than five minutes, but I tell myself, listen, you're just going to do something for five minutes. You're going to do one thing that moves the needle forward. Maybe that's only fixing a handful of citations. Maybe that's sending an email update to your advisor. Maybe that's posting a job on Upwork to hire someone to help you with the coding. And usually what I find is if I set that barrier real low, five minutes, come on, Laura, set a timer. You can do this. Usually I have a little bit more momentum 
momentum, or even if I only do five minutes a day, slowly I can work that up to more like 20 minutes and get up to an hour. Um, but even that five minutes a day is better than the zero minutes a day where I would do like one day of work <laughs> per month. And then I'm like, wow, I'm so far behind. Absolutely. Consistency is, is so underrated. Um, you know, it's just like trying to build a new habit, which is exactly what you're doing there. That if you do um, a mini habit, which I always describe as, you know, if I wanted to get in shape and I hadn't done anything, my mini habit could be one push up a day. Mm -hmm. And it sounds so stupid. Like if I told my friends, Hey, I'm getting in shape. I'm doing one push up a day. They'd be like, yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, you keep consistently do that. And then, you know, two weeks later, well, heck you're down on the floor. Why not do two? And then three, then four. So the same thing, you're getting that five minutes in. And if you do it consistently, it, it builds. So good for you. Yeah. And I think a lot of the research is pointing towards that being really effective. Um, you know, the book Atomic Habits by James oh, yeah. Peter just talks about trying to be 1% better every day. And mm -hmm. I see a lot of freelancers struggle. They'll say things like, well, next week I'm going to build my website. I'm going to write my first book. I'm going to pitch 35 <laughs> clients. And it's like, no, no, no. Like if we're doing zero of those things, like no, zero minutes of those things, exactly. zero effort of that now, it's weight, like you're setting yourself up for failure. So I found it to be helpful in all aspects of life. Like where can I be just 1% better than I was yesterday? This is not like an earth shattering revelation. What little thing today, if my walk was... 10 minutes yesterday, I can definitely do 15 today. You know, what, what things can you implement that are easy? And it's like, challenge yourself to just be that little bit better. And a lot of the research in that book, especially talks about how different companies and different teams of athletes who've looked at that kind of across the board, where are all the 1% levers that we can push to increase things and improve things, they tend to have better results over time um, as a result of that. So don't, don't set your bar, you know, so high, start small and celebrate that little progress. You know, like you said, the one push up, like that might not sound like a lot to other people, but that's, that's a win for you, you know, and whatever your win is, don't let anyone else, you know, diminish it. Don't, I think compare and despair is another issue mm -hmm. that comes up a lot. So the person who just start, has tried to start running and has downloaded the couch to 5k app is comparing themselves with the person in their neighborhood who runs four marathons a year. Like they are at a completely different place in their journey than you are. So don't feel like that's your barometer of success. Your barometer look might look a little different. Absolutely. And, and seriously, during this time, which you've you know, already mentioned the pandemic, I mean, I've actually been doing this since the beginning of January. I have a, a blank calendar that I print out and put the days in and then I divide each of the squares into four. And I have four things that I'm tracking. And I seriously have stupid little stickers from like a school <laughs> supply thing. And as long as I do whatever I have, you know, pick like one of them is I'm learning Spanish. So I have to do three Spanish lessons every day and they're on, they're on Duolingo. So they're super short, but I have, I have to do that. And, and then I get a sticker, you know, but oh, it's, it's, oh, it's the funniest thing. And I have it on my refrigerator. So if you, well, I'd say if you come over to my house, but you can't uh, social distancing, but I, I am, I'm proud of my stickers. I think it's absolutely hysterical and something that silly mm -hmm. actually works because at the end of the week, I count up my stickers and, you know, I'm shooting for 28 for, you know, four things, yeah. seven days a week. <laughs> I have not succeeded at 28, but I'm getting close. So um, it's, you know, it's just those little things. And product productivity doesn't have to be this amazing thing. Just like, you know, James Clear, who I think is, am is amazing. Yeah. The 1%, just 1%. If you can be 1% better in something that will move you forward, do it. Yeah. I, I love that. And I love the idea of the stickers. Like when did we all decide that we're too old for stickers anyways? Like that was so motivating in elementary school. Like, I guess we got too cool for it when we were teenagers and never came back. But now I'm thinking like, I have a huge wall calendar here in my office. I'm like, why am I not doing that? That would be so fun. Like, especially if I got really cool stickers. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I know it's the funniest, goofiest thing, but it seriously, it works. It keeps you 
on track because yeah, there have been days where, you know, it's almost time to go to bed and I'm like, oh, I haven't, I haven't done my squats for the day and oh, I will right. just pop them out. You know? <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And those little things, you know, it's not even about hitting perfection. Like you mentioned there, there's weeks where that hasn't happened. That's fine. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that you're not getting it perfect, but the amount of progress that you've made probably in all four of those areas has been significant and it's probably, you know, easier to do it now that you have a system for it. So I think it's really helpful to have those little, you know, reminders in there. One of my things is, you know, with this pandemic, as long as the weather here in Minnesota cooperates, trying to walk the dog twice a day, not necessarily because he needs it, but because I need to get outside in the sun and have time to walk and have nothing else on my calendar, no thinking, no phone calls, no other things. And so that's another trick that I've used too, is if you can involve someone else right now, that's going to be someone else in your house, or you can do something virtually. I'm part of a couple of writers groups where we'll occasionally meet up for an hour on zoom. We'll all mute ourselves and we'll go write for an hour and check back in with how many words we got done during that time. If you can involve another person or a pet in your plan, it makes it that much more likely because with my walk, I, I might easily write it off as, oh, I'm fine. I don't need that. But then I think, but the dog is looking forward to it and I can't let him down. So, <laughs> so I'm going to go. So involving other people is another great way to do it. Well, I love all of these tips. I mean, I've learned so much about procrastination, had no idea before we talked that there were different kinds of it. I thought it was just one thing and we all suffer from it at different times. And so it's been cool to dig into what that looks like for different people. Where can listeners go to learn more a little bit about you? They can go to my website, ellengoodwin.com. Uh, there's also a Facebook page, ellengoodwin.com. There's a theme here. Uh, <laughs> Keep it simple. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, those are the, probably the best place to find it. i it's, you've got it in the bio. I have a, a podcast where we go in. We have a super small, short podcast, not small. Uh, but yeah, check my website, check uh, Facebook page. Happy to help anyone out anytime. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It 